Most of the women who graduated over the next few years went into the missions and went overseas, often in China, India, and other countries as medical missionaries. But it's interesting to note that at a time that other medical schools didn't accept women, some of them like Harvard and Queen's University didn't accept women until after World War II, Dalhousie regularly had women in its classes. Some of them became very distinguished. Florence Murray, again a medical missionary uh, in China, was highly regarded by the Chinese for her work with epidemics and working with patients with leprosy. And there is a book about her life and experiences. There is also a book about the women graduates of Dalhousie in the first 40 years called Petticoat Doctors, written by Enid Johnson, who herself was one of the early graduates. So the Halifax Medical College was continuing, doing well, and the faculty were dedicated to teaching students who were going out and serving the maritime provinces. And you'll see around this time in the linkage between the hospital at the top for clinical training and Dalhousie University at the bottom where they took their degrees, but still continued into the 1900s as an independent medical college. The students each year began to increase, so it went from the original 12 and in the early 1900s graduating classes of 25, 30 were common and women were in all of these classes. There's one interesting little story about a degree that was given at the college at this time. You remember that Dalhousie was giving the degrees to the students, but the students recognized that they had the power as an independent medical college to also give degrees. There was a teacher, Charles Putner, who was a Civil War apothecary, came north after the Civil War and taught pharmacy to the medical students. He always wanted to be recognized as a doctor with a PhD, but when he applied to the university, they indicated that his background and his training didn't seem to be adequate to be granted a PhD the students decided they would give him one. And they had a little ceremony and they presented their professor with a doctor of pharmacy. And that degree hangs on the wall at the Victoria General Hospital. And you can see it there. And it's the only degree given not only by the medical school, but was actually given by the students. And on his gravestone in Camp Hill Cemetery, it says, Dr. Charles Emil Putner. And so he went to his grave as a doctor uh, because of the action of the medical students. Now another story at the time about the medical students was um, the story of the Christmas tree on the children's ward at the, at the Victoria General Hospital. There was no children's hospital in Halifax at the time, but there was a children's ward um, at the Victoria General Hospital. Two of the students who were working over Christmas at the hospital noticed that the children didn't have a Christmas tree. They heard that Studley campus had just been prepared by Dalhousie and they had planted some trees. So they decided to go and chop down a tree at the university and they took a fire axe off the wall and began to walk up University Avenue uh, to chop down a tree on Dalhousie's new campus. But on the way they noticed that the city had planted evergreen trees on University Avenue. So they chopped one of those down and brought it back to the hospital. And that's why, if you look at the line of evergreens on University Avenue, you'll notice a space. Now, as I mentioned, the faculty were proud of their medical school and proud of their graduates. But medical education around North America was uh, not always in a very positive state and it was recognized by the American Medical Association and the Carnegie Foundation and they wanted to do a review so they sent Abraham Flexner who was a school teacher to do a review of all of the medical schools in North America and he had in his mind the idea of the ideal medical school which was the new Johns Hopkins and so we went around reviewing all the medical schools didn't spend much time because he felt that a few questions could establish whether medical school was worthy or not with little warning, Flexner arrived by train in the early hours of the morning in Halifax with Dr. N.P. Colwell and 
did an assessment by asking questions of one representative from the medical school and one from the university and walked around, got back on the train later that day and left. But in his report, he had a lot of very negative things to say about Dalhousie Medical School, as he did about most of the medical schools that he visited. He said about Dalhousie, Calendar says Halifax Medical College, first class laboratory accommodation is provided for histology, bacteriology, and practical pathology. But he said one utterly wretched room is provided for all three of these. In fact, he indicated that the faculty seemed to know more about advertising than they did about medical education. Flexner also said there is no museum worthy of the name and no laboratory work in physiology or pharmacology. The laboratory sciences have been starved so that small dividends might be paid to the generally prosperous practitioners. Now the faculty were outraged. They were outraged at a number of things. They felt that the criticisms were not fair, that he didn't spend much time visiting any of these things that he criticized, he didn't speak to the faculty, and moreover, they were incensed that the suggestion was that they were really just taking fees out of the a process, starving the medical school, and that they were a, what was known as a proprietary medical school, one set up primarily to make profits. They were upset because they not only didn't get paid very much, but they sometimes would even give up their salaries for a few years to add new facilities such as an extension of the medical school for a path laboratory and gave up their salaries for this. So they were really upset. Despite that, within the next year or so, they made a number of changes. Now, the medical school then changed because of it, but half of the medical schools in the United States closed as a result of the Flexner Report. None of the Canadian medical schools did. And very soon after, the Carnegie Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation began to provide funds to many medical schools to help them improve, and the first one in Canada to receive funding was Dalhousie. Now one of the things they learned from the Flexner report was that they can't continue this peculiar relationship with Dalhousie. And as a result, they decided to disband as an independent school and again become a faculty of Dalhousie. So in 1911, the medical school again became a faculty of Dalhousie University and it moved from that building to the newly built forest building which is still there with health profession, but for many, many years was the medical school. Teaching again continued at the Victoria General Hospital and other hospitals that were developed around the area, and it began to teach also in some of the hospitals around the province. The next major event that affected the medical school was the outbreak of World War I, because many of the faculty went overseas, as did many of the practitioners, and the students on graduation often then immediately went overseas. Dalhousie applied to have a what was referred to as a stationary hospital, which is more like a mass unit. And the word stationary is peculiar because, it, in fact, the hospital moved with the front. As the fighting continued, the hospital would move along with that. But they were referred to as stationary hospitals. And Dalhousie eventually was allowed to establish one of these, and it went overseas and saw action in a number of sites there. But John Stewart, who was a very highly respected surgeon and a student of Lister, indicated that their first patients were German prisoners that they treated. This is a Christmas card uh, that was addressed from somewhere in France, from the number seven Canadian Stationary Hospital of Dalhousie University. And this shows John Stewart, who was then a colonel, sitting in the middle with some of his medical officers around him. Now on his return, the highly respected and beloved John Stewart became the Dean of Medicine at Dalhousie, even though he was thinking at the time of retiring because he was 72 years old. But he was a famous individual, particularly because he was so closely associated with Lord Lister of antisepsis fame and his outstanding ability as a teacher and as a surgeon. Now coming into the foyer of the Tupper Building, you can see the list of those who served in World War I. You can see the flag of the stationary unit and its emblem. 
And there is a list of all of the medical officers and students who served in World War I in that same area of the foyer.